This is the most fun I've had using a phone in a long, long time. And it's all possible due to the biggest ever external display fitted on a smartphone. Welcome the Motorola Razr 40 Ultra. A phone that I've been playing around with, literally playing around with for the past one week. And here's my review of the same. If you're here for the very first time, I'm Ershad. You're watching Track and Take English. Let's go. The Razer 40 Ultra's key selling point is that big, wide external display on the front. This is absolutely what we wanted and asked for in a flip style foldable and Motorola has delivered it with absolute confidence. You get a 3.6 inch AMOLED panel and that cuts through these two camera rings. And the best part is Motorola hasn't skimped out on any of the other features of the display as well. You get a 10 bit panel with HDR10 plus support and 1100 nits of peak brightness. The display has a pixel density of 413 ppi and it has Corning's Gorilla Glass witness protection as well. And I saved the best for last, you also get a peak refresh rate of 144 hertz. But it's not really about all the tech that is packed into this display. It's about the experience that it enables. You know, the first thing that you see is this clock face. And I must say this, Moo Time is the cutest little mascot ever. So you know what this mascot Moo does? It keeps doing something or the other throughout the day. It starts off by brushing its teeth, eating breakfast, taking a metro ride to work with the Motorola laptop in the hand, getting to work, typing on the laptop, coming back home, eating some food, checking the phone. Oh my God, it's just absolutely cute. You know what, at home, my wife and I were looking at Moo and every time we saw it, we went, aww, so cute. Now, once you're done with the clock face, you enter into the home screen. You have eight predefined panels, which includes apps, games, Spotify, uh, calendar, contacts, all of those. But I actually use Apple Music, so I wanted to set Apple Music as a panel that option wasn't available, only Spotify is available at the moment. It would have been nice to have that option to switch to an app of your choice as a panel. However, this is just nitpicking and you don't have to worry because you can use literally any app that you want on this external display of the phone, whether it is supported officially or not. Of course, you won't get the perfect aspect ratio and things might get cropped out, but it is just so much fun to be able to do that. I found it really handy to scroll through my Twitter feed and whenever I got any WhatsApp message to reply to that directly from the external display itself without having to open it, God sent, I'll tell you that. And because of the usefulness that you get with it, you can look past some of the unintuitiveness that exists with the UI. For example, when the keyboard pops up and you start typing and maybe you just made up your mind and you don't want to type anything and you want to go back and you hit the back gesture. And when you do that, sometimes it'll happen that the keyboard will start swipe gestures. And of course, since these apps aren't optimized, there might be certain UI elements that might break when you're using the phone. But I want to give Motorola the benefit of the doubt because even in its current state, I find it absolutely usable. Moving on to gaming on this external display, there are a few pre-installed games from this service called Game Snack, And it reminded me of Mini Clip back in the day. Who remembers that? Let me know in the comment section below. And from this roster of games, I am really addicted to stack bar. I cannot stop playing it and beating my own high score over and over again. Apart from this, you can also use the external display to show a preview of the camera feed. Basically, if you're taking somebody's picture, they can see what you're actually capturing. And you can also use the external display to take a selfie photo with the primary camera and the ultra wide angle camera. I'll talk about that in the camera section of the review. And to make it easier, I switched on Smile Shutter. This is the first time I've actually used that feature properly. Every time somebody smiled, the phone would take a picture and you just need to hold up the phone like this and smile and it'll take a picture. Uh, it was very, very easy. One thing I was curious about is, can I take a phone call from the external display without having to open it? Fun fact, you can actually do that. I have no idea where the earpiece is, but it just works. But one thing I noticed is that the display doesn't switch off because there is no ambient light sensor. And I don't think in the phone app, uh, Motorola is actually using the cameras to check the ambient light temperature. By the way, I did mention that the external display supports 144 Hz refresh rate, but all the time while I was testing the phone, I only saw up to 120 Hz. I never saw 144 Hz on the screen. So I don't know what's happening there. I'm definitely telling you the cons of this external display as well. But at the back of my head, I'm constantly thinking this is the best external display ever implemented on a flip phone. And I really, really hope that developers can actually make use of that display and tune their apps to work on it in 
the right aspect ratio. Hopefully, there is a standard aspect ratio for these external displays in the future. What with the Galaxy Z Flip 5 also coming with, you know, such a big display. All right, that's about the external display. But before opening it, let's take a look at the exterior design first. We have two colors of this phone. This is the Viva Magenta color. And this one has a fall leather finish. Extremely nice finish. Really good to hold and use. And definitely doesn't feel slippery at all. In fact, you won't even need to put it in a case. But the black version actually has Gorilla Glass Victus on the rear. And of course, there is Gorilla Glass Victus protection on the display as well, remember? So when you open it up like this, it's all Gorilla Glass Victus. But yeah, I mean, the black version might be slightly slippery for some folks because some people find glass slippery. So you might have to use a case with it. And you do get the case inside the box, so that's not really a problem. And now the sides, of course, are made of very high quality Series 7000 aluminum. They feel extremely sturdy and can definitely take a couple of falls too. We've actually done a drop test on the Tracking Tech Hindi unboxing. If you guys haven't watched that yet, go check it out. And by the way, this is also apparently the slimmest flip phone in the world right now. But the crux of the design is the hinge here. Undoubtedly, this is one of the toughest hinges I've used on a phone yet. It is so resistant that flipping it open with one hand like this is nearly impossible. The trick is to try to squeeze your thumb between the two halves and then give it a yank open like this, which then opens up with confidence. And when you shut the phone, it has a very satisfying thud sound. Listen to it. And by the way, Motorola uses a teardrop hinge design because of which there is virtually no gap between the two halves. And when you open up the fold, the crease is also bare minimum. You can feel it very lightly and you can rarely ever see it. But I did notice one thing is that when it's opened fully, it doesn't go entirely 180 degrees flat. There's a little bit of bend and a little bit of curvature. I think it's about 178, 179 degrees. A couple of other design aspects that I must mention is you get IP52 rating, which means that it is splash resistant and you also get a fingerprint scanner embedded in the power button which is very fast to unlock the phone. Overall this is the best designed flip phone with one of the sturdiest hinges that I've ever used and Motorola has also tested it for 4 lakh times of opening and closing cycles which is very good. I'm glad that Motorola has gone back to the drawing board and come out with some innovation for its very iconic Razer lineup. Good job Motorola. Now, because you use the external display so much on the Razer 40 Ultra, you barely ever need the inner display. You generally need it if you want to watch any Instagram reels, if you want to watch any video on YouTube, play games, or any other such activity that requires a big screen experience. Even for typing long emails, primarily because you can also see what is exactly being typed and if you're making a mistake, you can go and correct it as well, which is not possible on the external display because the keyboard takes up the whole display. Now, on the internal display, you get a large 6.9 inch 2K AMOLED panel. Now this display has a peak high refresh rate which is higher than that of the external display so you get a refresh rate of 165 hertz. But I rarely ever saw it go to 165 hertz. It was mostly stuck at 120 hertz. The only time that I did see it go to 165 hertz is when I switched on the high refresh rate mode from the game time app whenever you're playing any game and that's when it went to 165 hertz. Anyway, talking about the high refresh rate aspect of this display, this is also an LTPO panel and it can go down to as low as 1 hertz and I actually saw it go down to 1 hertz. There are many phones that would do only 10 hertz but this one actually does 1 hertz which means that this will also enable better battery efficiency in the long run. Now this display also has a peak brightness of 1400 nits. You take it outside, it is extremely legible outdoors and it's very bright as well but this is the kind of brightness that is required when you're watching HDR videos on YouTube and Netflix. But HDR support currently we saw was only available on YouTube and not available on Netflix. Hopefully an update will fix that situation, fingers crossed. And if you set the display color mode to natural, it has a very low delta E and the color accuracy is pretty good. The outer display doesn't have that good of a color accuracy, but the inner display definitely does. By the way, you get a touch sampling rate of 360 hertz on both the outer display and the inner display. And when you're playing games, especially on the outer display, it does come in handy. It registers touches very fast. One thing I noticed in my testing of the inner display is that it has a very tall aspect ratio of 22 is to 9 and this is not a normal aspect ratio for apps to run in. And therefore sometimes when you're watching content on apps like Instagram, there will be certain text which comes on the left or the right which will get cut out. Apps like Netflix when you're watching videos, it will have black bars on the left and the right. Massive thick ones. And when you actually zoom it in, it will crop a big part of that image. So you will have to wait for apps to actually update for this aspect ratio. But for now, there is a little bit of UI inconsistency happening. Happening, that's for sure. Anyway, to round up the multimedia experience, you also get support for Dolby Atmos. With the stereo speakers, these stereo speakers can get loud. They're also very rich and they sound very, very good. Take a listen for yourself and let me know what you guys think.
order to power all of this internally, you get a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chip and you get LPDDR5 RAM and UFS 3.1 storage. The variant that we were testing is the 8GB to 56GB variant of the phone. See, to expect a flip phone to be a gaming phone would be asking for a little too much. So Motorola, I will tell you, has tuned for power efficiency. And therefore I saw the CPU getting throttled and the GPU getting throttled in our regular CPU throttle and 3D Mark wireless stress tests. And the Antutu score could have been slightly higher. It wasn't up to the mark of other Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 candy bar style phones that we've tested. But this means that the temperature of the phone is in check most of the times and the phone doesn't heat up either. That's the kind of performance tuning that Motorola has gone for in the default setting. And I'm saying default setting primarily because when you're playing games, you get the game time mode and within the game time mode, you can actually switch on high performance mode. And you can also set the refresh rate to extreme high refresh rate as well. And when I pushed everything and played Call of Duty Mobile at low ultra settings, which means that it went up to 90 FPS of gameplay, the phone did start getting hot around the top portion and around this part of the uh, you know display so that's something that you have to keep in mind see if you're playing casual games like altos odyssey uh, and monument valley it shouldn't trouble the phone that much and that's what's exactly it's made for and for regular tasks like you know scrolling through your instagram feed twitter feed uh, replying to whatsapp text messages uh, maybe even opening up a spreadsheet and working on it all of that is very well possible on this phone without any problem and it's very fast very responsive very slick in nature I didn't have any problem whatsoever in regular usage. And you must be wondering then why use a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 in the first place? Well, the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 does enable the power required to power two large displays, right? I mean, the external display is the largest one. Even the internal one is very large. And this is from the perspective of a flip phone that I'm talking about. And you also need the 8 Plus Gen 1 for camera, ISP and other related functions. I will talk about how this ISP affects the camera performance, but you know, you have the opportunity to actually give good output. And along with 8 Plus Gen 1 and Motorola's legacy of having great telecom machinery, you know that the network performance on this phone is going to be great and it is actually great. I tried Airtel and Geo on this phone. Of course, it takes only one SIM and then you have to use the other one as an eSIM. And 5G performance was absolutely fantastic. The call quality, particularly through the earpiece, was very, very good. I did talk about 8 Plus Gen 1's performance during enabling battery efficiency. So how big is the battery? Well, it's a 3800 mAh battery and it's only slightly bigger than the Galaxy Z Flip 4. And thanks to Motorola's optimizations, I did get really good battery life. And this is again from the context of using a flip phone. The phone can easily last you a day's worth of usage. You will have to charge it by the end of the day. How long the phone actually lasts you will depend on how much you've used the external display and the internal display. Now, if you're somebody who's getting most of the work done with the external display, I think you can even stretch it to one and a half days of usage. Now, if you're wondering, Asha, where's the screen on time stats? Well, unfortunately, uh, the screen on time stats for flip phones and fold phones right now will not be accurate. Primarily because the screen on time is calculated only for the inner display and not the outer display. Android limitation, you see? So therefore that number is not trustworthy at the moment. The phone also supports 30 watt charging speeds using the wire and the charger that you get inside the box. It took me about one or 20 minutes for a full charge, which is okay, not the best. And apart from that, you also get five watt wireless charging speeds as well. It's too slow for me to actually use it. But then again, I think the charging speeds are slower primarily because you get a little surface area over here. And apart from that, you don't want the phone to heat up too much with 15 watt wireless charging either, right? All right, let's finally talk about the cameras. You get a 12 MP plus 13 MP camera setup on the rear, and you also get a 32 megapixel selfie camera on the front. First things first, there is really no point using the selfie camera on the front because you can use the primary camera and even the ultra wide angle for taking selfies and even selfie videos for that matter. And the quality obviously is going to be better on the primary camera compared to the selfie camera on the inside. So I don't see a point. Anyway, while I was testing, the primary camera can take in a lot of details, but the colors are too damn muted. My food that you can see out here wasn't this uninteresting looking. It was actually very tasty, very colorful plate of food and it just looks very dull at the moment. The HDR performance is pretty decent at controlling bright sources of light, but there's definitely a lot of noise in the shadows for sure. People's pictures are good with the right skin tone when you shoot in balanced, even lighting conditions. But pictures of people against the light in HDR have generally messed up skin tones. Portraits look all right, but definitely not flagship grade. All that said, low light pictures with the night mode look really impressive with great control over the bright sources of light, even exposure and requisite amount of details too. This makes me wonder if Motorola could tune for great night mode photography, why couldn't it go one step ahead and do that for HDR and portrait photography? Because that takes a little bit more effort. Now the ultra wide angle camera doesn't get too wide. It's actually not wide enough to be called an ultra wide if you ask me. And there's absolutely no color sense consistency with the primary camera either. 
You can also capture macro shots with the ultra wide, which look good if you have ample light for it. Now, video recording is possible at 4K 60fps using the rear camera and the quality is not very good because HDR performance is not the best. Now, you do get HDR 10 plus support for video recording, but don't expect it to improve the video quality by leaps and bounds. You can also shoot 1080p 30fps videos using the ultra wide angle camera and 4K 60fps using the selfie camera, which is good. Overall, what I felt is that the hardware is there, but it requires a few more software tweaks for the camera performance to become better than what it is currently. And if you want a good flip phone with a good set of cameras, the Galaxy Z Flip 4 is your best bet right now. The camera is definitely the Achilles heel of the Razer 40 Ultra at the moment. Now talking about software, the phone runs on Android 13 and you're promised software updates of three years and security updates of four years. Hopefully Motorola does give the updates on time. Let's wait and watch. Now the Motorola experience with my UX, you all know by now is very close to stock vanilla Android. It is of course a very, very premium experience. And the embellishments on top of vanilla Android with something like Moto Actions where you've got the chop chop to open the flash and twist to open the camera. All of that is absolutely very useful. There are more gestures now. For example, you can double tap on the back and you can take screenshots, you can get voice recording done. Basically, you can set whatever you want over there. There's also the Moto Secure feature using which you can use features like Pin Scramble. Now, the one thing that you must be wondering is how is the app continuity option with two displays available? And the app continuity is done really well. So if you have an app running on the outside and if you want to open it up on the inside, the moment you open it up, it opens up the app. But if you have an app running on the inside and when you fold the phone and the external display shows up, you have to hit the continue or open the app button for it to open up, but it does work. There's no option for an always on display, but there's always Motorola's peak display and it works very well. So I reiterate, I've had too much fun with the Motorola Edge 40 Ultra to look past its shortcomings. The major of which is of course the average camera performance, but boy, look at Moo, so cute. The outer display is actually useful and it's fun to use as well. The inner display is also really nice and sharp and the software experience is refined too. The performance is good and the battery life is dependable. Compared to the Z Flip 4, the biggest advantage on the Moto Razr 40 Ultra at the moment is the larger display that you get with it on the external display. Of course, the Z Flip 4 will have a better camera performance. That is something that you can expect from it. Hopefully, the Z Flip 5 can come to give a tough competition to this phone. So what do you guys think of the phone? Let me know in the comment section below. And if you're wondering about the price, well, it's priced at 90,000 rupees with 7,000 offer available on card discounts and it goes down to 8299. Now, Motorola is also offering a no-cost discount, which means that you can buy this phone for 12 monthly installments of 7,500 rupees flat. Now, here's the thing, right? Uh, this is one of the biggest, uh, you know, adoption factors for a lot of Samsung flagships. And seems like Motorola is also taking that same route uh, for its flagships in India. All right, I'll leave you guys with that thought in your head and I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep tracking and stay safe.